I'm Lisa Garcia Bedoya. I'm, I'm the chair of the center. And um, I am thrilled to be presenting or for us to have the opportunity to hear the presentations from our Marco Antonio Firebot Queen Gate scholars who've been working now for over a year um, on a number of, of engaged scholarship efforts. I want to thank um, this program would not have been possible without the office of with Vice Chancellor Gabor Boss. I'm sorry, it's been one of those days. Vice Chancellor Gabor Bossery's um, Office of Equity and Inclusion. And so we'd like to thank Elizabeth Gillis for being here and being our camera person. Uh, so she's uh, done a ton of work to make this grant possible. And then I'd also like to thank Rosa Isela Rodriguez, Veronica Velez, and, and Joina Sal, who's not here, all of whom uh, worked very closely with these students and really uh, work with them through the research process. And so today we have the opportunity to hear the fruits of that work um, and, and what they what they have come up with. So our first grouping, so the way we're going to organize this today is we're going to have three sort of mini panels, so groups of three papers that come up. And then we're going to have time for question and answer at the end of each paper. So we wanted to be sure that everyone had the time that they were allotted, because often when you have this many people presenting, you end up the folks at the end don't have time because people ask questions with folks in the beginning. So Rosa is going to be keeping time. So if you could please hold your questions on the papers, unless it's a clarifying question, something you're confused about the presentation, if you could hold your questions until the end, that will help us move this along and make sure that all of our scholars um, have the time that they need in order to present their work. So our first group uh, is made up of Catherine Cepeda Ariola, Linda Sanchez, and Marco Flores. Um, Catherine's paper is called Taking Steps, Exploring College Predispositions in College Track with Young Youth. Catherine is currently uh, a surf scholar, and I've had the privilege of working with her on this project. I'm excited to hear where it is today. Um, after graduation, she plans on working with youth before pursuing a master's degree in education. Um, she would like to use education to increase the numbers of underrepresented students in the higher education pipeline, beginning <coughs> with her community, which is Oakland. Um, Linda Sanchez's paper is Indigenous Sepultics in California, Endangerment of a, a Transnational Indigenous Language Amongst the 1.5 Generation. Um, after graduation in 2014, Linda plans to travel to, well, this next semester she'll be traveling to Washington, D.C. to conduct research uh, with nonprofit institutions. She'll be studying for the GRE and the LSAT. Ooh. Very ambitious summer plans. Hopefully having some fun in D.C. as well. Um, and applying to join programs in the spring of 2014. She'd like to attend Georgetown or Berkeley for her graduate studies. Um, Marco Flores uh, is a 2012 graduate. He's currently a Judith Lee Stronach Visiting Scholar here at Berkeley. His paper is entitled Undocu Arte. Um, he is pursuing art practice by exploring the arts as a medium of transformation and consciousness, and he actually was the driving force behind, behind the wonderful Indocumentation Conference that happened last month on campus. If people missed it, they should look it up online because it was pretty incredible. So with that, I would like to welcome, start with Catherine. Um, welcome our first group. Um, it's still lagging a little bit behind. 
And when compared to all the Oakland schools, um, including charter schools, continuation schools, and alternative schools, um, the graduation rates um, do look a little bit higher, the drop rate a little bit lower. However, what is the other side of the statistic affecting Oakland youth is that the homicide rate in 2012 was 131. Um, the highest since 2006, which was 148. Um, but the number of youth who are dying um, is actually increasing. Um, the last homicide in 2012 was a 15-year-old girl walking to BART. And actually, two, uh, two days ago, five youth were arrested between the ages of 13 and 16 for killing um, a paramedic, a suspect paramedic, a state suspect, 13 years old, just got caught today. Um, so how can we change that? Um, the research, my research question was, what are the factors that encourage or inhibit Oakland students to apply or not to the college track program? And the framing behind my research was Ricardo Stanton's Salazar Social Capital, which validates that students, low-income students, actually do broker social capital um, amongst one another. Um, and also Mario Small's theory of social capital and organizational embeddedness, which basically discusses how organizations that people are a part of routinely um, create and reproduce network advantages for people. Um, so for me, um, the school was that one of the, those organizations in which students um, uh, broker social capital. Um, so for the methodology for this research, I interviewed 17 students, 15 who were recently admitted to the cost track program, and two students who did not apply to the program who I recruited via school sampling. Uh, to get a better idea of who these students are, I mapped their, um, their residences based on zip code. And as you can see, the majority of students um, who apply to the program um, live in, along um, East Oakland. Um, Mayor Jean Kwan outlined the 100 blocks um, as the ones where the most violent crime occurs, particularly homicide. So this got me thinking, are there youth in East Oakland who want to go to college and just don't have the means to? Um, is that how, why they're referring to violence? Um, what are schools offering for these youth? Um, so one of the first things that I approached um, in my research was how did these students find out about the program? Um, 11 students discussed that they heard about the program through the presentation. So in February and March every year, College Track um, and its staff goes on to eighth grade classrooms to talk about the program um, uh, to try to recruit students. Um, six of the students who joined the program who didn't um, heard about the program through counselors, teachers, um, principals or family members. And then I asked students, well, did you originally attend, intend on applying after you heard about the program? Um, all students in this uh, research project and this presentation, are the names are pseudonyms. Karina described, no, because I was going to feel kind of weird because I didn't know anyone in the program. And the presentation didn't really explain until my teacher told me more about it. So she didn't initially think about applying. Uh, Vanessa similarly described, well, my brother, he got lots of, uh, lots of scholarships, and I thought maybe I don't need a program to help me get through high school. My best friend would have been me to apply. She was like, you should come. It's going to help you get to college. Um, for the non-applicants, which were Ayana and Lulu, um, they described, I didn't go an application out. I didn't know where to go, and I just didn't go. I didn't know where college track was. The counselor described, um, Lulu described, the counselor said today was the last day, and if I could take it to the office, but I didn't have time, meaning the college track office, which is in downtown Oakland. Um, so as you can see, the difference between the two applicants was that um, it was somebody who told them more about the program that actually influenced the decision to apply. And so the major finding that I found was that the greatest factor encouraging or inhibiting the student's decision to apply or not to the program is the motivation obtained from people in their environments or the lack thereof. Um, Charlie described, the school asked the teachers which eighth grader they think should go to college track to get the help, and they chose like seven kids. And Karina similarly described, we had to fill out the applications during lunch, so a lot of people just quit because they wanted to spend their lunch outside. I was going to quit at one point, but then my teacher told me not to. But non applicants, um, they like people in their environments to provide them with social capital and resources to apply to the program. So there was a lack of motivation in this one. We describe a situation with our teacher. She said, of course, teachers would mention college. A history teacher would say stuff like, you're not going to go to college like that. So there was a classification in the students who applied who didn't versus who was deserving to find out more information about the program and who wasn't or who was deserving of going to college and who wasn't. 
um, peer networks who are also a big influence and in, um, brokers of social capital. Like I mentioned earlier, Vanessa, her friend is the one who influenced her to apply to the program. Um, I decided to include Trinity because I think her experience demonstrates how this process works, but also what were some of the other factors that um, motivated the students to apply? Trinity explained, we always meet at this private spot during lunchtime. And we say, oh, are you guys going to college track? And they said, yeah. Well, I want to come because there's opportunities of free food, and I could apply to many scholarships, and it's for free and good education, and that's great. So I applied with my friends. Um, there was also social capital in the home, um, as Karina described. My mom really wanted me to apply, and then we were doing the essays and everything. She would see that I wouldn't really do them, so she would hurry me up so I could turn my application in on time. Andrew described. I asked my sister if I should go, and she said yes. She said that if I needed it, I should take the opportunity to do so. We talked about how you can help us. Now, Lulu, who didn't um, apply to the program, explained a conversation with her mother. She said, oh, you better do that, because you're going to need all the help you can get when you get to college. So as you can see, there are very different experiences that these students, um, these processes that these students went through when they applied to the program. Um, as far as I saw Lulu's experience, there were less and less people who seemed confident in her ability to go to college or her, or her decision to apply to the program. <coughs> and so based on these experiences, I came up with a model um, to kind of map out the motivation and the decisions of, of making of these students. Um, students were faced with the presentation, however, many of them did, did, not, face it, did not apply to this program just off the school presentation. Um, there's a there's school personnel who intervened, as in this case of Karina, um, who her teacher talked to her twice about um, applying to the program. Um, then uh, here, the peer influence also motivated a lot of the students to apply, more, even more than the presentation, which shows that peers were also very important. <coughs> and outside of the school setting, families also became very important in terms of um, uh, talking to the students about the program, sharing more information, and more of the reasons why they should apply. So therefore, for outreach programs, um, it is important that they not only outreach to the student, but the environment in which they take a part of. Um, even outside of the school setting, um, families should definitely be involved because once, school, once students are outside of the school setting, um, who's there to provide this influence and this motivation and this information um, about you know, the decision that they take. And so for the next steps in terms of um, the open community, since graduation rates are improving and dropout rates are decreasing, how do we maintain this momentum? And we can't expect schools to just do it all on their own. So it requires a collaborative effort between schools, after school programs, community organizations, including members of the community and parents. Lastly, I would like to thank my mentor, Lisa Garcia de Loya, Rosa Rodriguez, Vero, Alejandro, and CLPR for this event and for making this research possible and my company Fireball Scholars for this support.
So um, I'm going to start with this uh, phrase, uh, with this passage. El pasado se retoma para la reflexión del presente. So the past is reclaimed to understand the present. What this means is that, or at least my analysis of this is that you need to have a historical, uh, a, a, whole, a holistic historical understanding of the past in order to understand the current present of indigenous populations within you know, California, the United States, <laughs> and in Oaxaca. Um, that means that you, know, you, cannot, you, you cannot neglect the facts and the historical traumas that indigenous populations have suffered under colonialism, uh, imperialism, and right now globalization. Uh, you cannot neglect those uh, in order, or you cannot overlook those when, when trying to analyze the current situation that indigenous people live, uh, live under right now. And if I'm sticking to pass, let me know, okay? Uh, demographics, so pretty much 7%, or at least specifically 7.13% of, uh, of the Mexican population is composed of uh, indigenous people. Uh, what that means, maybe more, but this is specifically to individuals that still speak uh, indigenous languages. So overall, I mean, there's 90, you know, only 7% of the indigenous, of indigenous people who still are able to speak indigenous languages still live in Mexico. Uh, this is a little bit scary given that, you know, if the, the migration is increasing drastically to the United States, and migration is actually a very recent phenomenon for indigenous populations as well to the United States. <coughs> and so if, not, if there's not an intervention, um, that, that, that percentage rate is going to decrease drastically. Um, out of those 100, uh, 100, 100 Thousand, 250,000 indigenous Oaxacans reside in the LA metropolitan area. So that area is a very concentrated area uh, that has a high percentage of indigenous populations. And that can be uh, seen also through uh, folkloric events that happen. Um, you know, every year they have the Galagueta. So it's very interesting to understand this because we have a big concentration of indigenous populations in, Oaxac in, um, in LA and they're uh, bringing a tradition uh, to the United States. But when it comes to the 1.5 generation, the language is not passed on, and therefore the culture is not passed on. Uh, so that, 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 that paradox is a little bit interesting to analyze. Um, and so uh, roughly uh, 50,000 50, to 60,000 are indigenous Zapotecs. So um, why that is happening is because Oaxaca is composed of at least a vast percentage of native speakers or indigenous speakers that speak Zapotec. The other languages are, are even slimmer, so mixed day, um, you know, and other languages that are spoken throughout Latin America. Um, I think Zapotec is one of the uh, ones that are spoken um, highly. Uh, so factors influencing language loss. Um, this is specifically what I'm looking at. Like, what are the factors that are leading to uh, language loss? And um, this phrase could kind of show that. So, so socioeconomic, uh, so, so socioeconomic, demographic, and community factors negatively uh, correlates with indigenous language use. So pretty much is, if you speak an indigenous language, you are indigenous and therefore you are placed in a lower um, social status than the rest, you know, for somebody that let's say speaks Spanish or Spanish and English. Um, and I'll, and this, this, this didn't get out of nowhere. Um, why indigenous languages are looked down upon is because of, you know, like I said, colonization. Um, Indigenous people, one of the main ways that they really try to eradicate like that indigenous identity is to try to get rid of that indigenous language uh, that the indigenous people, uh, individuals spoke, right? Um, and so, and also policies. I think it was barely in 2004 that policies were actually passed to protect indigenous languages rather than to eradicate them. So, you know, that was long way. You know, that was barely in 2004. And that clearly shows the kind of racism that still happens within indigenous populations. Um, so why this is alarming? So in Mexico, um, indigenous identity is closely related to the knowledge of an indigenous language. So like I said, um, at least for me, I am able to. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, because I'm like I get okay. Um, so like I said, um, within Oaxaca, at least with Alejandro. <laughs> <laughs> indigenous um, identity within Oaxaca, you need to speak the language. This is because indigenous population is still very prevalent and very um, visible there within the communities. Um, when an indigenous language loses speakers, there are two major problems that arise out of that. So first is that indigenous language is threatened, and like we saw, there's only 7% indigenous language speakers that are left in Mexico. Um, the cultural identity of that ethnic group is also threatened. And this is a little bit problematic because we have um, indigenous communities throughout Mexico and throughout Oaxaca that are very diverse. 
um, you know, there, you know, based on the municipalities or los municipios, um, it, the, the communities are composed and are kind of pretty much autonomous. They speak their own language, have their own culture. However, if the language, the language speakers diminish and we have less speakers, then the indigenous communities become a little bit more invisibilized and that means that there's less rights protecting them as well. So this is a little bit uh, alarming to know that the lack of indigenous language can lead to an identity loss and a culture loss. So my, so my presentation was a little bit quick but uh, my ro the roadblock that I face is, you know, some, some at least within the United States, do romanticize the reclamation of indigenous roots without truly understanding what it means to be indigenous. Um, I call this a simplified revolutionary <laughs> act, as this rec reclaiming of what was lost is merely adding on to the historical trauma and oppression indigenous people continue to endure in today's society. Um, so, you know, starting with the presentation that I'm just going to speak to you all, the reason why I started this presentation was because I myself came to the United States identifying as a 1.5 generation. I arrived here very, um, when I was nine, speaking only my native tongue. Um, fortunately enough, I was able to still hold very close ties to my grandma who only speaks my native tongue, which is up with it. Um, and now I'm, I am still able to speak it, and as well as my older sister. However, my younger siblings, three of them, uh, were just in the same process. Um, they came here speaking um, Zapotec, but however, within a few years, they were, um, they, they forgot about the language completely. Um, and this was a phenomenon that I saw throughout my community. <laughs> There's like 20,000 distractions going on there. Um, so it was, <laughs> so it was a phenomenon that I, I observed throughout the indigenous communities in um, Orange County and LA area, where these kids arrived at a very young age speaking only their native tongue. However, because the negative notions of being indigenous and the stigma that, that comes along with that um, and the historical trauma that the parents have, been, have endured in Mexico um, leads them to kind of overlook the importance to, re to continue on the language. And so parents oftentimes tell the children, um, you have to learn Spanish and specifically also English. You have to master these lang languages in order to climb up the socioeconomical ladder. If you are not able to fully adopt these two languages, your chances to, to be better than me and do better than me are very slim. So you can see that you know there's, there's, there's a lot of factors leading to language loss, but ultimately the people who have and carry this language are the parents, right? But because of the racism, the oppression, <laughs> the racism and oppression, <laughs> Um, but they have endured in Mexico, and it's very evident there um, has led them to kind of want to forget about it. And why I observed was a form of protecting mechanism when I was doing my research, and I didn't really put it here. But it's a, it's a form of protecting mechanism that the parents do not want their kids to suffer the same demise that they did. Um, and the older the individuals are, the more they internalize this idea that it is their fault for all that they went through. So pretty much, um, the way that Mexico is structured and the way that, you know, it's, it's very structured in the terms that um, the government and the state has a very important role in creating this idea that the native, he, should, he or she should blame herself for her own downfalls and nothing else. Either one, for not assimilating into the homogeneous society, um, or two, for not leaving their language and becoming more civilized and, you know, adopting modern forms of um, beliefs and um, ideas. So. Um, <clears throat> this was a picture that was circulating today um, on Facebook, and it's really interesting because it's, it, I think it really speaks to, my, to what I'm doing right here, um, which is what I'm saying, right? Like a lot of people still try to romanticize about indigenous identity, and they try to glorify it, right? Like, oh, I am Zapotec, or I am an Aztec. Um, and you don't really carry the, the language on, you don't speak the language, and you haven't endured the racism, so by you trying to claim that and making it, trying to uplift yourself through doing that, you're overlooking, or whoever does that is overlooking now the racism that the indigenous people actually have to endure. And I think it's very necessary for us to understand that indigenous people are not the past. So when we speak of indigenous people, we have to speak of them of the present because they're still living and their population is still thriving. However, because of the current circumstances that they're living under, um, if, if there's not an intervention, then their um, population is going to diminish and the language loss is going to be ever more prevalent and it's going to be catalyzed by racist policies. Right on time. Yeah. <laughs> So my presentation is titled, 
Uh, what is it? <laughs> it's not too hard then. Okay. <laughs> so my presentation is now. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Marco Flores. Um, I'm a recent grad from Berkeley uh, from the Gender and Women's Studies Department. Um, what else? I'm pretty cool. I'm amazing. <laughs> um, so my interest is around uh, undocumented identity in relation to queerness and the arts. Um, so that's what you're going to be hearing about. So it's not, my work is not really research-based, but it's still really fabulous, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, that's all that information. Um, okay, so I'm going to start off by talking about women of color feminisms. Um, so I want to start off by reading a quote, um, which is located in Gloria Saldua's Borderlands, La Frontera, um, the Numa Um I heard a snap. That's great. Um, <laughs> So, 1,950 mile long room, dividing a pueblo, a culture. <laughs> we'll ignore that. What is happening? I'm sorry. It's, it's all good. Yeah. It's all right. Okay. It's back up. So, 1,950 mile long room, dividing a pueblo, a culture, running down the length of my body, splits me, splits me, me raja, me raja. This is my home, this thin edge of barbed wire. So the reason why I want to start with Gloria Saldoa is because um, in, in 2009, um, it was shortly after my first semester at Berkeley, and um, I started learning uh, and I started reading women of color feminisms. Um, and you know, I had read other kind of like feminisms before, like you know, Foucault, Lefebvre, Butler, and they just felt really foreign to me. Like they didn't speak to me, like it just, it was just like, that's great. It's super fabulous theory, but it's not working for me, right? And so then I encountered someone like Gloria Saldua, who's a queer Chicana feminist, and I learned, started learning about uh, what it means to be a hybrid self, and so at that point in my life, I was really struggling about what it meant to be queer and undocumented. And to be more specific, um, I felt like I always experienced my queer and undocumented experience as two separate, uh, I feel like I'm giving up this thing right now. Um, so, so I felt like being queer and undocumented was always really separate, right? So, and I always did that, like, I always did my, my people of color organizing with people of color, and then I did my queer work with, like, white folk, and I was like, yo, like, my life is so torn apart, it's a hot mess. Um, and then I, I met, you know, I met work by, like, feminists like Gloria Saldoa, right? And so, I started learning about what it means to live in the borderlands, right? And to live in a place of in-betweenness, of what it means to be at constant conflict with yourself. I can't believe I'm not nervous right now. Um, and uh, so then I started formulating connections. I started formulating connections around, you know, um, it felt possible to weave different fragmented parts of myself and bring them together, being queer and undocumented and a person of color. Um, and so that was in 2009, I, I encountered Gloria Sardua. And then moving on to 2010, um, one of my uh, mentors, uh, Trinity Minha, um, she was really wonderful at teaching me and introducing, introducing me to uh, other women of color feminists. Um, and one of the quotes I want to read from her work is, uh, today when I'm asked where home is for me, I'm stuck by how far it is, and yet home is nowhere else but here at the edge of this body of mine. So Minha, uh, she's a post-colonial theorist um, and a filmmaker, and uh, a lot of the work she does is around uh, displacement of uh, immigrants in the United States or elsewhere. Um, and so I started finding these connections of like, yo, I'm like really interested in this idea of the body. Like, what does that mean, right? And so uh, because what I felt was like, yo, like, lo siento, like I, as, as a queer documented person, like, I'm not feeling this like theoretical framework that is so abstract and so out there, but like, I feel it, like, it, like I feel it. Like, lo que sentir con el corazón y con el cuerpo, right? And so, uh, and so I was like, okay, this is like leading me somewhere, but I don't know where it's leading me. Um, and then in 2012, I uh, started reading more by um, uh, queer um, feminist Chicana, uh, Shady Moraga. Um, and this is the quote that really I felt grounded me in the sense of I knew the medium that I had to um, dive into to really understand the work I wanted to do. Um, and so the quote is, I'm grateful for these first moments of consciousness, always born from a living experience of injustice turned into righteous rage, the first experience of genuine collectivism and blessed epiphany of art-inspired action. And so, um, and so after reading this, I, I kind of, you know, I started, um, I sat down, I applied to this fellowship, and um, in the fellowship, what I really wanted to do was uh, really address this topic of undocumented and queerness and, and displacements through the arts, because I started believing that the arts really provides a space um, 
where people can engage with their own stories and their own narratives in a way that um, research doesn't do it, right? In a way that research, uh, for me, at least my experience, always felt really distant and felt like I just wasn't connecting uh, in that sense, but creating art felt really awesome. Okay, so the next slide is titled, um, so I'm just gonna lay them out, it's titled uh, Stories of Survival, right? So I engage with this idea of testimonios and auto historia teoria. And so testimonios, um, I got the idea from the Latina feminist group um, who wrote Telling It to Live, Latina, Latina Feminist Testimonios. Um, and what, you know, the idea of testimonios, uh, and I'm just gonna read a quote to sum it up really quick, is that testimonios is papelitos guardados who keep in our memory, write them down and store them in safe places waiting for, a, for an appropriate moment when we can return to them and review an analysis or speak and share with others. Um, and so then I started connecting this idea of testimonios of like sharing your story of like who you are and like your experiences and what you experience in flesh with, with Gloria Saldua's Auto Historia Teoria, which is, uh, you know, personal experiences revised in other uh, ways redrawn uh, become a lens in which uh, we read and rewritten existing cultural stories and create new stories of healing, self-growth, cultural critique, and individual collective transformation. And so having this knowledge of like, I feel re really distant from theory, um, and but having this understanding of like, there's something about the arts that is really, like it has my attention and I'm trying to understand it in relation to like me sharing who I am. Um, did I start exploring the creative process? And so more specifically, the creative process in the sense of the arts. Um, I felt that through the arts, I was able to really understand these stories of survival for a lot of undocumented folk. Um, and more specifically, my interest has always been to work with my communities, which is queer and documented folk. Um, is that a prejudice? No, I, so. I just want, I was just looking for a like, community that, that like, I could connect to. Um, and I felt like the creative process was also a really uh, nourishing space where people could, you know, learn to negotiate their lived experiences and their realities. Um, okay, so before I go into that, um, now I'll just go into it. So uh, one of the events that I was working on was called Undocumentation. Um, so that happened on February 15th uh, at the International House. And so I've been working a lot with uh, Javiana Rodriguez and Julio Salgado, uh, who do a lot of really great, wonderful work around migration in the Bay Area. And so what Undocumentation is, is Undocumentation is a series of, of, you know, it's a celebration that, a uh, cultural celebration uh, uh, that addresses the topic of immigration through the arts. So one has happened in uh, San Francisco in May 2012, and the other one happened in North Carolina right, right before the DNC. And the third one happened here in Berkeley. And so my attempt with that event was, oh, it's blank. So my attempt, because I'm supposed to show you photos, that's why it's blank. So my attempt with that event is, um, it was really about uh, being able to, and I'll, I'll tell you why I'm showing it on Facebook right now. So my attempt with that event was really to kind of bring the topic of immigration uh, through the arts, right? And you know, oftentimes when people talk about immigration, like for me, like a lot of talks just feel really dry, right? Like research just sometimes for me just doesn't work and it just feels like, oh, I don't wanna sit through these like three hours of like immigration presentation. Cause that, what, I, what I feel really, really is that um, I already know the experience. I know the experience of living undocumented. I don't need to be hearing about it. Like, but that's great. Like, there's really important people doing really great work that is essential to where we are today with undocumented youth. Um, so all you immigration scholars, good job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, so undocumentation, um, so undocumentation was really wonderful. You know, we were able to, to bring 300 and plus uh, individuals from, around, from different communities in the Bay Area to the International House. And so um, it was a lot of work. Like I felt it was an immense amount of work. I had to collaborate with different organizations. Um, well, I was able to collaborate with different organizations and different artists, and uh, we were just able to bring a lot of people. Like you know, like and just art has this ability to kind of get people's attention. And as you've seen, you know, like throughout um, recently. Oh dang! So recently, um, sorry, I just saw the time. I have zero minutes. So, so recently, you know, um, the immigration debate uh, has been picking up a lot, but also there's been an influence of the arts, right? Uh, the arts has really picked up this conversation and has um, introduced this conversation of undocumented career most recently. And also there's been this shift of like parents being involved, right? And parents being in posters, parents like speaking out. Um, and so yeah, you know, the indoctrination was, uh, there was readings, there was uh, performances, and these are just some photos. Um, 
And so, so you know, what we've been doing is we've been using Facebook as an archive to really put all that information for people to check it out. Um, and so, you know, so this is some of the photos. Um, okay, so I'm just going to move on to to my final slide, which uh, which is on this undocumented teatro called uh, Our Undocumented Lives that I worked on. Um, and so that was a, a workshop put together by uh, Shari Muraga and. Um, and so let, let me just give you some, let me just show you some photos. I wanted to show some footage, but I, I completely ran out of time. Um, so this is just some footage of like, you know, the work that we've been doing with students around, um, you know, what aspects of their life are undocumented or go without being documented. Um, and so we had them doing a lot of body work. So you know, like in a sense, I feel like I'm coming back to this understanding of what it means to create art with your body and through your body. Um, because art is not just about like, getting a paintbrush or like, you know, if you're a creative writer, it's not just about picking up a pen and writing. Like there's an actual process and an understanding. Um, and I feel like uh, a lot of artists understand this idea of being sensitive and um, like being sensitive to the world and understanding the world in a very different way. Um, so with that, I completely ran out of time. So I'm just gonna wrap it up there. So the arts and documentaries. <laughs> Identity. How? What are other ways that um, language could either, or besides language, that you could either maintain or reclaim identity? Um, so, is this specifically to for indigenous communities? Yeah. What do you What do you think? Well, language is one. It's not the only factor that that kind of gives a form of identity to indigenous populations. It's also attire. So, it is in the way that they dress. The female have a very specific. Um, form of dressing, um, and this also ranges from color shades. Um, I am able to say this because in my village, uh, or my community, the women wore very like lively colors, whereas the next uh, community that was like a few hours away from us, well, it was more dual the colors. So it's not only language, but it's also the form of attire, and also the form of uh, the cultural practices that they have. You know, so which is what, they're, they're interconnected. You know, you cannot look at them that's not being connected together. So language, attire, culture, they're all interconnected. So losing one definitely jeopardizes the other. And this is why it's so crucial for us not to let them uh, go extinct or, you know, we need to save this language for this purpose. I have a question for Linda again. Uh, just um, which ways would you, would you think that you could promote your culture, or you could you could uh, like take care of it or nurture it. What like what what uh, strategy? Like what what do you think you should? Well, I mean to? personally for me, I feel that really maintaining my language is a revolutionary act in itself, and that's a way that I have been able to um, kind of challenge the status quo because I am expected to come to a university like UC Berkeley and totally forget my language and really integrate within like the, the culture here, right? And pretend I'm a Mexican and really neglect my cultural identity. And it really surprised the community that, you know, coming here to Berkeley and it not only enforced my, my indigenous identity, but it made me want to learn more about it and we teach it. So yeah, like definitely myself, you know, being as that body, as that like, political body walking through campus but also going back home and letting them know that there is no shame in being indigenous, that there's a that there's a very powerful um, you know idea behind reclaiming your indigenous identity. But not only that, but you also have to make sure that you let the people know that it's okay to be indigenous. There's no shame in being indigenous. So I think one of my ways of nurturing it um, is making sure that I, pre I preserve that language and that I continue to practice it. So now that I go home I speak with the elders. So you know it's 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 a very um, Revolutionary act, we can say, right? For me to be seen as a as a woman of you know as a woman, a scholarly woman, um, and go back home and speak with the with the elders 
that kind of sends a message to the youth who are e easily can say, I don't speak the language, but seeing me as somebody very influential, powerful within the community, go back and speak it with my youth and take so much pride in it, like it gives, it gives them another idea to like, well, maybe I've been told that my language is something that I should be ashamed of, but maybe it's not, like maybe I need to challenge that rhetoric, mm -hmm. so. I had a question about uh, the college track. Um, is, it, is that a, that's an outreach program or a nonprofit or maybe to expand on the, the role? Sure. Is that specific to Oakland? Um, um, when, it, when I was there, um, it was specific to um, the Bay Area, but now it's uh, actually a national nonprofit. So they have, they've recent, they're growing really fast. They have sites now in New Orleans, Los Angeles, the, um, East Palo Alto, San Francisco, Aurora and they're still continuing to grow. Um, so it's definitely a growing program. It's a college access and it supports um, students for eight years. Ideally, they still continue accepting students up to 10th grade, mm -hmm. however, they begin outreaching to eighth graders, rising eighth graders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other? I actually have a question for Michael. What, what do you plan to, not to put you on the spot or anything, but how do you see this work moving forward, yeah. you know, once your fellowship ends? And um, I, so I don't well, need to ask you what you want to do with your work. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I think um, for me, I've been learning through this through this work that I've been doing. I've been learning a lot about um, what it means to work as a collective, and uh, more specifically, how the arts has that ability to really bring people together um, and really, you know, share parts of themselves that have been just um, hidden for whatever reason um, to really expose themselves in different ways. And so I think in the future, I see myself, um, you know, I see myself pursuing a PhD, but more specifically a joint program, program and MFA and PhD, because I really want to continue this work, you know, working with like community, and I feel this is the best way for me to put what I consider to be theory into practice. So in hearing all of your presentations together, I, uh, I'm, hearing different manifestations of immigration from uh, people not um, having access to programs, to people losing cultural identity, uh, to people feeling like uh, uh, theory doesn't really uh, reflect them. What I also heard is that um, uh, getting parents involved, community members involved, uh, and, and integrating art into into your work uh, actually does preserve uh, or advance the community. Uh, uh, do you think that there is an opportunity to integrate all of those elements in your specific work to uh, to ensure that that uh, young people do have access to higher education, that uh, uh, cultural identity is preserved, uh, and and that. Uh, on, on docu immigrants um, are able to see themselves reflected in society. Um, well, from my end, um, so I didn't get to show you a clip, but some of the doctoral work that I was doing um, with a few students and my son, what I got, uh, we were, so part of their assignment was to go back home um, and interview siblings who are undocumented. Um, and the idea behind that was because, you know, Currently, there's a lot of conversation about undocumented youth, more specifically undocumented youth in higher education, right? And it's just really flat, you know? It's really flat that it's just, it, undocumented immigration looks a lot more diverse than that. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. And so, as uh, so that's the work that I was doing, um, we were able to get students to interview um, parents and siblings who are undocumented. And uh, for some of the students, they were able to weave in those interviews and those uh, visual uh, interviews into their data work that they were doing. Um, either kind of like introducing family or like them playing out like the character of like their parents or like their siblings or whatnot. Um, and I think in, in doing that kind of work, uh, I think not only is there a kind of preservation of that diversity, but also there's an understanding of like that history that sometimes parents or siblings don't talk about. Um, and for me, I would add, um, I think, yeah, I think we could incorporate all of that because I think one of the most um, the things that stuck out there to me the most throughout this whole research project was what somebody told me that there is no inner city fix. So we definitely have to look at the community and see what its strengths are. 
I mean, I think definitely incorporating things like the arts and different ways of co um, contacting families and encouraging families to come out definitely depends on the community of Oakland. For example, the, you know, in Oakland there's a lot of working families who work multiple jobs and therefore they work, are not easily able to com commute all the way to downtown Oakland to meet with program staff or things like that because they have to work. So how, what are other alternatives to do that? And for example, um, looking at Yosa's work in terms of community wealth, um, incorporating things like linguistic capital and different things like that to so specifically work with the community in Oakland and the ways in, um, in the capital and the strengths that they bring into the discourse, I feel like that's really important. So exploring alternatives through the arts and through other means, I think it will be very effective in terms of changing those raw communities for the better of the youth and everybody that comes. Um, I think that for indigenous communities, like I said, you know, their migration is something that's a very recent phenomenon that started in mid um, 20th century. Um, and so that when they arrived here, like the other communities were already well established. So the Mexican communities were already well established here. Uh, and it's a little bit more difficult for them to not want to be part of the community. So I think their ultimate goal is to be part of the community and integrate themselves within the community. Um, art is definitely something that it's very, um, that's, that, that's something that they, they, they uh, cherish a lot. So you know, like I said, at least in Los Angeles and areas like Oxnard and San Jose, they have guelaguetas. You know, the guelaguetas are kermes, I don't know how to say it in English, but um, it's like celebrations where they really do bring the culture out and they celebrate the food, uh, they add tires, and you see all this kind of, uh, you know, L like just amazing things going on, like forms of arts going on. Um, the only bad thing that I've noticed is that it's, they don't really average outside of the community. So they, you know, where, wherever they're in within the Mexican communities, they kind of just, you know, congregate there. And so it's the outreaching is a little bit more difficult because I think their main goal here is they don't want to differentiate themselves from the overall community that they're, you know, surrounded by. But I think yeah, it's very necessary to bring in like the different forms of art and try to like unite the communities in order to make, you know. Um, any movement that we're trying to advocate here for um, stronger, but I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> with Asian Health Services, which was your partner, correct, for, right. for this project, or um, work with the Clinton uh, Global Initiative? Thank you. All right, so uh, my title is Mathematical and Statistical Approach to Medicine and Public Health. And I'm going to first start with uh, a little bit of background on cancer. So what is cancer? Cancer is a group of over 100 diseases characterized by abnormal, and uncontrolled cell growth. In a healthy body, cells grow, die, and are replaced in a biologically controlled mechanism. Damage or change in DNA by inheritance or environmental factors can result in cells that do not die and continue to grow until a tumor develops. Now, um, there's a difference between cancer and tumor, and a lot of people think that they're uh, synonymous. Uh, now, cancer is, uh, tumor has two different forms, malignant and benign form. Benign is, uh, the one that w will not cause you any uh, significant uh, 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 threat, uh, uh, harm, harm, right? And 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 cancer is the malignant form of that. So you know when people uh, when when people uh, and patients say that doctors when doctors tell them oh you have a tumor, you know the first notion that they'll get is oh my god I have a tumor what am I gonna do? They do not know the fact that there are two different kinds of tumors out there. So just wanted to clarify that. And uh, metastasis is also uh, a, a very important topic. It, it, metastasis is the spread of a disease from an original site to non-adjacent parts of the body. Uh, cancer cells penetrate into uh, the blood vessels and circulate to other sites. Most cancer-related deaths are caused by metastasis. And in fact, metastasis killed 90% of all cancer patients. So also coming back to what people usually think about cancer is that when they discover that they have cancer, they have this notion that they have this notion that um, that they'll have a very little chance of survival. But in fact, if you get a again early diagnosis, and if you can prevent metastasis because that's what's causing the ninety percent of all deaths, then it can prevent uh, uh, you know future deaths caused by cancer. So this just a couple pictures of metastasis, you know. For example, if you have a breast cancer or lung cancer, it can spread to you know brain and all of these other parts of the body. And uh, for the next slide, I'm gonna go into I'm gonna very briefly go into what I've been doing at Asian Health Services. Um, so this is uh, it's a, a group of uh, 
community centers founded in 1974 in Oakland's Chinatown. Provides uh, primary health care services to low-income families and it uh, provides 10 different languages. Now, some of the projects that I've been involved with, I labeled them down here, there, but I want to emphasize uh, three of them because uh, mm -hmm. one of them, two of them involve community-based participatory research, which was a huge part of this uh, research. And, and the other one is patient cycle time, which uh, it involves a lot of statistics and mathematics to the field of public health. Uh, I'm going to start with patient cycle time. So um, we have Asian Health Services has a lot of patients. Um, and you know when you come at 2 p.m., patients might have to wait uh, 40 minutes to an hour. And when they see a doctor, it could be 5 to 10 minutes only. So to prevent that, uh, biostatisticians, epidemiologists, and mathemat mathematicians came together to figure out how can we come up with a model so that we can minimize, minimize the number of uh, the amount of time that the patients wait, but also maximize uh, the amount of time that they get to spend uh, their time with doctors. And that was a really, I, I just did a small part of that project, but it was a really uh, a significant experience for me, allowing me to discover that mathematics can ask, actually uh, get involved in uh, you know, public health med and medicine. And the other one I want to uh, emphasize is tobacco cessation program, and um, that one goes along with community-based particip participatory research. And I love that part of the research because they decided to invite uh, patients, former smokers or uh, cancer survivors, and uh, hear their opinions instead of just doctors and researchers talking to each other. And by doing that, doctors got to figure out things that they would not have known without the patient's perspective. So for example, one of the things that, uh, one of these, one of the stereotypes that the patients held was that smoking can be only prevented by themselves. That it's, if it, let's say it's out of 100%, that it's 90% individual responsibility, which is totally not true because health clinics provide all different kinds of programs and, and uh, uh, medical prescriptions to help them quit. And, now I'm going to get into the math part. Oh, actually, before I go on, <laughs> this is a picture that they used to kind of, instead of labeling down all these uh, scientific terms that a lot of people might not, not understand, they use uh, pictures like these to, uh, I guess, uh, you know. Uh, Scare there you go. <laughs> Scare people. It's raise, easy to, to raise awareness. Raise awareness. <laughs> very easy <laughs> to understand. <laughs> Very easy to understand too. Multiple poison signs. <laughs> and and this got me into a field of biomathematics and biostatistics. And I'm going to start uh, with a slide on uh, a brief history of it. Uh, applying mathematics to biomedicine has a very long history. In fact, it started in the early 1900s. And it's been going on. And in the 21st century, uh, uh, in the early 2000s, the main figures are uh, Larry Norton and his colleague Joanne uh, Mustang, I believe. And, okay, and before going on to uh, 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 the main topics, I want to briefly talk about Benjamin Goldberg. And he's, he was a mathematician and an actuary, uh, developed the uh, Goldberg's model, which describes population growth. And it's currently used to calculate life insurance costs and, so and software reliability. And, and they found out recently that it actually describes tumor growth. And that's just a formula. And, and uh, Gomberg's curve is an actuarial model developed in 1825 to calculate the cost of life insurance. It's, it's an it's a S-curve. And, and what Larry Norton and Joanne uh, Massar did is they've been arguing ever since, uh, since 1970s that, that that a certain S curves, for example, like Lombard's curve, can just can accurately describe uh, cancer growth. Um, and he's currently the deputy uh, physician in chief for breast cancer at uh, Sloan Kettering Center, Cancer Center. And unfortunately, they've been—I uh, don't want to say ignored—but uh, a lot of doctors and uh, medical practitioners uh, kind of dismiss them. That they concluded that mathematics and uh, biomedicine are two distinct, two distinct uh, areas of uh, science. 
Um, and now this is the Bloomberg's curve in, t in, in the context of cancer growth. And before, okay, so I'm gonna, so instead of uh, explaining, like formally explaining, I'm actually gonna give a, give a, a brief example, an example of what's going on. So let's say, uh, uh, let's say the solid curve is, is the cancer growth for the first time cancer patient. So when it grows, let's say, uh, let's say you, a doctor detected your cancer at, at any stage in between here. Now the current methodology for chemotherapy is that you get it every three weeks at a massive amount. And, and oftentimes that can be hard for people. Uh, it's, it's, it brings a lot of side effects and it, it's just hard to endure. And what Norton is suggesting is that with the formula and other mathematical knowledge, we can actually, actually figure out how often we can give out chemotherapy to minimize uh, the side effects and the, the extreme pain that they endure, but at the same time, minimize the chance of cancer regrowth. Um, and going back to the example, let's say, let's say a patient uses a standard therapy uh, at this stage, now, and let's say cancer almost disappeared. Now, most of the time, uh, cancer does not always, there are dormant cancer cells, and it tends to regrow, and the problem is that the faster you kill cancer cells, the, fast, uh, the faster you kill it, uh, the faster it's gonna regrow. And another problem is that the faster you kill it, it's gonna be even harder to detect in the beginning, and once you detect it, it's, it's just gonna go way too fast. And, and, and that's one of the things that Norton has been arguing, is that if you sequentially give out chemotherapy at a regular interval instead of all of them at the same time, we can prevent this, this, this stage right here and also prevent this fast growth. Uh, so the, you know, these are the questions, how fast do uh, tumors grow, how fast do cancer cells develop resistance to therapy, how quickly do cancer cells? So these are all the questions that you know, we'll be able to answer by applying mathematics. And like I said, a corollary, the faster you suppress a tumor, the quicker it'll regrow if you haven't killed it all. And in most cases, you can't kill all cancer cells because a lot of them are dormant. And like I said, initial reaction, they all said it's a waste of time. Fortunately, it, 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 they discovered that it's actually a, it's actually a very good model. They, it took, it, well, unfortunately, it took decades to prove this point because, so in 2002, a, a giant, uh, a couple of European governments uh, decided to carry out um, an experiment on Norton's theory. And in 2009, a Japanese uh, government also conducted a trial. And, and what they found out is that people who follow Norton's model um, have better chance of survival from 5 to 25%. And that's, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and I just want to say, this is not a perfect model. This is a, a rough model. So with just a little bit more of time, you know, we can even create even more better models to increase the survival rate of cancer patients. And uh, my last slide, I'm gonna be really quick. So my future plans, to, <laughs> so I wanna continue my research at Harvard School of Public Health and cooperate with Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. I wanna uh, work on coming up with a mathematical formula and model for cancer growth and sequential dose density. And at the same time, emphasize community-based community-based participatory research. So while we're switching computers, I'll introduce our next speaker, which is uh, Jesus Bernabe Zamora Pineda. He's going to be presenting on, and I have to say, Spinget, Spinget? Spinget. 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 Sorry, not, not in my lexicon. Um, in colon cancer, chemo prevention and treatment. Um, he's also graduating and plans to continue doing scientific research um, to apply to medical school where he hopes to do research and uh, clinical trial work. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta feel me on that one. <laughs> no, I can't. Yeah. 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 So, um, no, you can logic. 
<laughs> okay, so um, thank you everyone for being here. And uh, so, as she says, Hugo Dines and uh, colon sure. cancer uh, chemo prevention and treatment. So, a little bit of background about colon cancer is the second most deadliest cancer in the world. But in the United States, African American and Hispanic are the ones that have the highest index and the highest incidence and have the lowest uh, survival rate. Uh, when comparing the data from like the, um, how many people had colon cancer back in the 90s compared to uh, 2000, there has been a 45 increase of um, people that have uh, colon cancer at the ages of 20 to 49 years. So that means that younger people are getting more cancer. <laughs> um, some of the reasons why so, so, some people uh, suggest that this might be the case is because risk, fa risk factors such as diabetes, chronic inflammation, and also um, obesity. Well, anyways, uh, also the diet. What what do you eat? What kind of sources do you have? Like. And we know that in this country, um, it's easier to get a hamburger than actually to get a broccoli. Or, you know, it's, it's really um, amazing how the diet has an implication in this. Also, the screen practices. Do you go to the doctor often? Do you have colonoscopies once a year, um, 45 years old, if you are an African American man, is the recommended age? And then, of course, genetic factors. Uh, everything has genetic factors. Now, um, the, one of the most recent studies have been shown that um, developing nations have, have an increase of colon cancer incidence. And this might be due to the fact that they are getting, um, adopting a very unhealthy diets. And when I say unhealthy diets, I mean that low um, percentage of uh, fiber, high percentage of fat, you know, like McDonald's or something. So now understanding how the, the food that we eat, how it influences these pathways of both um, inflammatory and carcinogenic signaling. And when I say inflammatory, it's because there is this uh, notion that um, colon cancer is related to inflammation. So inflammation happens first, and then um, cancer follows that. But um, now. So what is the cellular pathway? Come on, right? So everybody wants me to know. So let, let's bring it up. <laughs> right? So it's the key, and he has an idea. He wants to have pizza. But the pizza he wants he only has meatballs and vegetables. So now he goes to the doctor to get his advice. He goes to his wife to get his advice. Now he goes to, to the one that manages the money. Now this person hires two persons. One is the butcher, the, the, the one in charge of um, Finding the meat. The other one is a farmer, the one that throws stuff. <laughs> now, uh, the farmer realizes that he needs more workers because he cannot do it alone. So now these workers realize that they cannot do all the work either. So they hire two more. Now this guy only hires one more. Now the butcher realizes that he has already um, um, employed four uh, persons. But three of them specialize in chicken, and only one specialized in beef. So he decided to fire those three <laughs> of the chicken, and then he hires three more of the specialized in beef. Now, collectively, they all lead to the perfect pizza, the one that he initially wanted. Now, uh, science tends to very um, call everything complicated. It complicates things uh, very, very much. So now, um, so, uh, biologists uh, call this downstream and then up is upstream. <coughs> now, all, all of those that are good by the message are core targets. And then when, for example, the butchery uh, fired the three people of chicken, so that was a down regulation. Whereas when he uh, hires three more, um, then he uh, up regulates the people, right? So um, now, colon cancer progression, and uh, I'm thankful that he presented first, so <laughs> I don't have to explain that much, but uh, there is two pathways, two main pathways that, um, that have an influence on the uh, growth of cancer. One is cell division and apoptosis of cell death. Um, you have, we all have a certain number of cells in all tissues. Now, it is important to keep that same amount of cells. So all of these cells get old, so they need to die. But if you grow, 
three more, you need to kill three more so you can have the same number. Once that one of these pathway, uh, one of these individuals, um, so each one of these individuals represent that protein. Remember that. Uh, so n now the, these two pathways, if one of these proteins is not working properly, it's not doing its function, then uh, it will lead to either a cell division like greater or you will not be killing as fast as you can or something will go wrong. And so now, if the colon cancer, it starts out with stage zero, so you get your first uh, aberrant cells uh, in, in your colon, and then it starts growing and growing, and it doesn't become a problem really until it, it crosses the mucosa. So once they cross the mucosa, it's able to um, go to the blood vessels and then spread it everywhere, and it's really complicated. So. It's more complicated to understand the pathways, which one of those processes is having a function in both um, in, in the development of cancer. So, as I said, um, we focus on two of the main two of the pathways that might be influencing this, which is the inflammation and also the uh, the car carcinogenic one. And there is so 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 many um, factors that, and so many proteins in charge of these pathways. So one of the special ones that I want to draw attention to is the beta catenin APC, and GSK3 beta that are part of the weight pathway. And um, that has been in intensively studied in colon cancer. And also COX2, there's still some, um, um, some, some controversy, I would say, uh, whether it has an influence on this. Uh, but it, it, it for sure, so if you have more COX2, then you're probably going to um, have cancer at the end. So now, it's finger dines, funny word to say. Uh, <laughs> finger dines are a single lipid metabolites from plants, soy, and other uh, organisms. The reason why um, it's important to talk about this is because uh, it's important to understand what we eat and what chemicals are in the food that we need to eat so we can uh, prevent the creation of cancer. Uh, what we know about sphingodines is that they're cytotoxic to colon cancer cells, both in vivo and in vitro. And, um, and, and in vivo, when you give it to mice, they reduce the tumor genesis. And also, uh, in our lab, um, they, they've shown that uh, it influences the wind pathway, the pathway that I say is being studied the most. So now, p um is a it's a peroxisome proliferator activated receptor before it does what we just everybody is. So it's a receptor that is upstream and then it regulates two main pathways. One is uh, in charge of the metabolic signaling such as uh, obesity, diabetes, or heart disease. And then the other one is uh, related to cancer. So by focusing on PPAR gamma, it will give us a very uh, broad understanding of how Obesity and diabetes could have uh, uh, implications on uh, uh, cancer. So now the question is: if single dance does have any influence on pre gamma? So we, what we did is uh, Western blood. So I'm going to explain a little bit how Western blood works. So every single one of this is a, a, a protein, right? Every single individual, each individual has a particular mass. Now, by considering the mass, then you can like open up the cell, grab all the, the people, all the proteins, and then you can treat them, and then run it in the jail, all uh, by running electricity through it. All of these uh, proteins will be uh, separated according to the mass. So these will group up in the same um, position, and then you use antibodies to identify the particular protein of interest. Then you use a secondary antibody that will give a signal, and then you can catch it on X-ray. X-ray film. Uh, what we found is that um, first we ne we needed to make sure that we are not cheating, so we just did acting, and then acting is just representation of how many cells you have per uh, condition. So everything was the same, so we did not cheat. And then, um, <laughs> and then we look at people gamma expression, and as you can see, with the this is the amount of finger dance in these two different kind of cell lines. And as you increase the amount of uh, single dyes, you increase the amount of people gamma. And then we look at the targets. That's cycling D3, cycling D1, that have been previously shown to be the um, down regulated by people gamma. Is it doing the same in this case? And it, it actually does. Now, P27 and P21, P21 get up regulated by people gamma, and it has sh been shown before. So this is a strong correlation that people gamma activity is also being increased by the single dyes. 
Cogstool, on the other hand, we look at as uh, time progresses that Cogstool gets degraded with the single time, so that's really good. Uh, now, we wanted to show this in vivo as well, so we use mice, and then the current model for um, inducing colon cancer in mice is you give it um, like an injection, and then you cause an, uh, a mutation in the genome, and then you give us three cycles of uh, uh, DSS, which is a carcinogenic, and then you uh, sacrifice the mice at the end to analyze uh, the uh, the procedure of cancer. So what, what we have been, we have one group that were treated with the um, vehicle and the other one was treated with sphingodines. The sphingodines did not show the same um, harmful effects that the other one did. So that was really good. And also the pre gamma expression was upregulated with the one treated with the sphingodines. So that means that the correlationship between the survival and the, uh, um, the levels of pre gamma is extremely related. So um, that's it, and <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, like, I compare myself with the, the, the way my, my parents used to eat when they were my age, mm -hmm. and we don't have the same diet. Mm -hmm. Like, we've been changing, we've been adapting, and sometimes not for the good, sometimes mm -hmm. it's for the bad. So, we need to keep an eye on how, like, we all have moms that tell us, you know, like, you need to eat this, you need to, and we just tend to ignore all of this. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, like, that's the personal thing that you need to commit yourself to eat healthy and keep your healthy diet. I think he got all the main points, but I just wanted to add, um, I think diet is, diet plays a main part of uh, cancer. And a lot of people, I think a lot of people, at least my friends, they neglect that. They say, hey, uh, you know, what's gonna happen if I eat, I'm not that, if I eat at this fast food restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> but if you, uh, if you do that constantly for a long period of time, that's gonna accumulate. And that has, I think, has the potential to cause cancer. And, you know, like my mom always used to say, when you look at ingredients, don't eat anything if it has anything that you can't pronounce. Mm -hmm. You know, these, these days, if you look at the labels, you have all these weird, uh, chemically made up, Thanks. yeah, that you're not sure whether it's gonna, you know, it's gonna, how it's gonna affect your health. In fact, I, I, I found this website where it labels down all the, all types of chemicals that are in our current food products that might, that might cause cancer. It has been proven, but it might. Now, it's, these are recommended by doctors. And and you know I looked at the list and when I go to when I go shopping I look at the ingredients and I I'm really surprised to find out that I see so many of them in the food ingredient list and and I think um, it's important to you know for all of us to know the general population to know that and I think there should definitely be more research that yeah it's a yes question yeah yeah okay I was wondering if you have done research uh, regarding maybe the the uh, effect of maybe transgenic food, so th so food that comes from transgenic crops. Mm -hmm. So for example, maybe, I mean, I, I don't know, like, sometimes I think about hot Cheetos, having some crazy transgenic <laughs> corn in there, you know, or these types of things. So I, I wonder um, if you guys know anything about that, um, if you wanted to talk about that. No, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, but I don't know, like in terms of the research that is being done here, even at Berkeley, mm -hmm. everybody's looking at the good stuff, you know, like what can, because mm -hmm. like you, you need to focus on, if you want to get money to do research, you want to show that your research is going to have more benefits than have mm -hmm. any, you know, like a, what would be the benefit of having discovered that this food will give you cancer when you don't really have anything at the end, you know, other than just, oh, we're going to bend it. But I think public health people, they do tend to look into that, but they don't do biologically uh, perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Beth has a question. Okay. It may sound silly, but it's a very serious question on my end. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, like it's, it's like elementary, it's like elementary, it's like elementary. I guess other than like the obvious reason of not using humans, like why do we use mice? Oh, well, that, that, that's a really good one. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, the reason why we use mice is because uh, from the very beginning of biology, right? So um, there, there, there are some models, like uh, we can use sea frog fish, we can use other kind of fish, but there, they're different from mammals, and even mice are different from, from humans. You want to take a model that will assimilate the most to human being, right? So if, also you need to keep in mind, one, that you know everything about the, this species, that you know how to make a knockout out of one specific thing, that you know the embryonic state, that you know everything, and for mice, like, it's very um, well known. And also, uh, the other thing that I want to say is, um, it's very cheap. <laughs> Cheaper than other <laughs> Okay, last question? Oh, yeah. oh okay. Uh, I have like three, but it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we want to make sure everybody's got time, so sorry. You can ask them after. Yeah. Okay.
Well, okay, we uh, okay, this one's um, for Terrence, I guess. Okay, so you have the two different um, scientists or uh, mathematicians that were arguing, I'm sorry, like for this time. One of them, which you were focusing on, was proven to be wrong, right? Or said to be, that's incorrect. Why is it that the other argument seemed a lot more logical? Uh, can you specify which scientists? I don't really remember the name. Numbers or Numbers or You mean that whole, the 1825 one or the, the one 21st century? That you weren't focusing on, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, the one that I, was it on the slide? No. Oh. Masage. Uh, Masage. The Masage and Norton are, right, are they together, work together, right? Right. right. Uh, yeah, we'll speak after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to, it's my pleasure to introduce our final group. Our first speaker is Gabriel Monico. <laughs> Also, a soon to be graduate. Um, um, and within the context of the immigration reform talk this week, we're really talking about those youth who are not dreamers right now. Mm -hmm. How do we think about um, their position in our society? So, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, on this slide, uh, you can see projected a uh, mural that was painted in 2011 by the 67 Sueños Collective. And it's titled No Human Being is Illegal, like Cada Uno Tiene un Sueño, and Each One Has a Dream. Um, so I'll be talking about this um, collective and the work that they do throughout my presentation. But before I give you some background information about my research, I would like to read a quote by um, Rosa, um, one of my study participants. And this quote speaks to the images that you will see projected on this slide pretty soon. Um, in the media, undocumented youth are always criminals or stellar students, illegals or valedictorians. Yet, but there's 67% of us who are not in a path to college, yet we're not criminals either. So where's our voice? Where are our stories? It seems as if 67% of undocumented youth don't exist. We're invisible in the shadows and unheard. But we're just like you, and we will be heard. So I'm including this quote to illustrate a single point. The media portrays undocumented youth as either superstars or criminals, but we don't hear, as Rosa puts it, about the majority. So what is it about this 67%? So out of the 11 million undocumented immigrants in the US, 2.1 million of youth may attempt to legalize through the DREAM Act. They've been acted as part, of, as part of the immigration reform plan introduced this week. And currently, its stipulations provide that individuals must have entered the country before the age of 16, have been in the U.S. for at least five years, have good moral character, and complete at least two years of college or military service. Given that only one in three undocumented youth finish high school, the bill would provide relief to about 825,000 individuals, leaving behind 67% of the total number of undocumented youth. So arguably, the DREAM Act discourse focuses on the stories of the high achieving, academically exceptional students. So this focus on advocating for the more quote unquote deserving of a path to legalization captures the influence of market citizenship in defining who has the right to be fully incorporated into US society. So what is market citizenship? Market citizenship is based on the economic output of an individual rather than under social rights or belonging. It is a wholly privatized and marketized notion of rights, which leads to the formulation of exclusionary definitions of membership. Of course, work and the economy are ever present in the American imaginary of citizenship, and found not only in the DREAM Act, but also in the ways other immigration campaigns and legislation make membership claims, including the rest of the current immigration bill. So based on these observations, my research questions for this project were, Number one, what factors made undocumented youth activists less bad of the DREAM Act discourse become involved in the immigrant rights movement? Number two, do they challenge the market citizenship often embedded in immigrant legislation and activism, and why? Number three, how do they frame their claims of citizenship in the United States? So given the time constraints for this presentation, I'm actually gonna focus on question number two, and I'm gonna touch briefly upon question number three. 
So from June of 2012 until January of 2013, I worked with the 67 Science Collective. And this collective was created in 2010 after recognizing that the majority of migrant youth were not being included in the debates about immigration. Currently, the majority of the collective are high school Latino age um, undocumented high school age Latino undocumented youth from East Oakland. Some of the activities that they have been involved with has been paint, have been painting murals, helping organize immigrant rights demonstration, and pu publishing stories about people left out of the Dream Act discourse. So as part of the methodology, I conducted about 250 hours of participant observation, working with 67 sueños. I also conducted 50 semi-structured interviews my participants' ages range from 14 to 19 years old, and their countries of origin were Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras. Before I move on to discussing my findings, I would also like to express that I decided to carry out this project not only for the sake of knowledge production, but also in an effort to contribute to social justice. And this approach stems from my lived experience as an undocumented activist, which has helped me situate my knowledge around this issue. However, something that was pressing concern, a pressing concern throughout this research is that while I'm in, I, I am an insider because of my background, I'm also in a position of privilege because of, um, I attend college right now. Um, but being in the Fireball program provided a space that really helped me understand my positionality. And also I had the opportunity to work directly with 67 Sueños through engaged scholarship. Um, and that allowed me to get closer, closer to my participants in a very collaborative, collaborative manner. So based on my observations, I'm going into my preliminary findings now. Um, members of the 67 Sueños Collective associate the market citizenship embedded in the Dream Act discourse as being based on false notions of meritocracy. Some of the youth express that they believe that their hard work does not affect who ends up with what, does affect who ends up with what, but the impact of merit and economic outcomes is vastly overestimated by the ideology of the American dream. And this is illustrated by Marta, Marta's participation at a meeting um, where we watched a video about the violence that takes place in the U.S.-Mexico border. And so Marta raised her hand and said that while it is important for the group to know about the issues in the clip, we also needed to keep in mind the problems that happen in the U.S. In a tone that evoked frustration, she said, you all realize that we could get killed just because of the color of the shoes we wear. Why is the sur or el norte? What matters is that we are brown and what, that we go through these problems now because we have struggled for too long. Yes, we live in the U.S., but we have always lived in the poverty line. I think many of us will still be poor even if we had papers. No matter how hard you work, you're never going to get ahead. As Marta mentioned, members of the 67 Sueños Collective find themselves struggling against structural oppression in their daily lives. Marginalization serves as proof that hard work doesn't necessarily translate to getting ahead economically. In her comments, she makes reference to gang violence and to two prevalent gangs in East Oakland, Sureños and Norteños. She expresses a number of problems faced by the immigrant communities in Oakland. And so this exemplifies the collective skepticism towards the validity of general notions of meritocracy and the refusal to accept the market citizenship embedded in mainstream immigration reform discourse. Given that this doesn't align with the socioeconomic realities that they actually face. And furthermore, they must be skeptical in the face of rhetoric that indirectly blames them for not working hard enough to be deserving of citizenship. Also, members of the 67 Sueños Collective, again, they reject market citizenship as the basis for claiming citizenship or belonging, given that it has a dehumanizing nature. So throughout the semester, I also observed members engaging conversations, highlighting what they considered the exploitative and unequal relationship between the U.S. and immigrant labor throughout U.S. history. So during a political education meeting, the youth watched a science fiction film about immigration and labor, and this film was titled mm -hmm. Steve Dealer. Afterwards, the youth engaged in a heated discussion that focused on labor exploitation and dehumanization. And so Patricia said, did you all pay attention to what the woman said to her co-worker towards the end of the movie? Something like, we give the U.S. what they've always wanted, all the work without the workers. I was like, she's so right, when I saw that. From then on, they kept on discussing how throughout their lives they've been 
witnessing the witness people in their communities being abused and exploited by employers for many, many years. Mario added, just like in the movie, they treat us as robots. The government doesn't really care about us. They care about the labor. That's just wrong. Pablo, the youth mentor, interjected and said, so what do you all think about this movie and the movement to pass things like the DREAM Act or even immigration reform? Any connections? People in the group mentioned that they believe this legislation was created in part because the U.S. is interested in the labor of the potential beneficiaries but does not actually care for their personhood. Pablo added that immigration reform, he was referring to ERCA, which was passed back in, back in 1986. In the past, immigration reform has provided ways for the authorities to increase in humane acts that silence the humanity of new immigrants, in spite of the fact that it legalized three million. So my participants appear to challenge market citizenship by suggesting that it serves to commodify immigrants through the rhetoric employed in favor of legislation and to regular immigration status. And again, such arguments see immigrants primarily as potential beneficial assets to the United States economy, and they do not address the economic need for exploitation of immigrants, but instead they seek to regularize them. So instead of framing their membership claims through market citizenship, what 67 Sueños does is they seek to articulate their demands by arguing that everybody is entitled to human rights. They also articulate a new definition of citizenship and belonging by claiming a connection to the land based on indigeneity. Um, so for members of the 67 Sueños Collective, their perceived Pan-American indigeneity forms a basis for claiming belonging in this land, even if they're excluded and marginalized by the state. So thank you. Our next speaker is our own Alejandro Jimenez. His paper is Untold Undocu Youth Narratives. Alejandro is a graduate. Well, how about her? Uh, uh, he was born in Defra and he came to the United States in 1995. He's interested in graduate programs in education and the study of critical pedagogy. He's working on becoming a better writer and a published scholar, and I should just add that he keeps this place running and has also Woo! been the one um, running our blog that we've been doing for, for this year, uh, which is uh, Voices from Latinos Across the Cal Campus, and we appreciate your work. Thank you. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm nervous. Wow. <laughs> I always. Yeah, I know. I always. You set up and sit down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my name is Alejandro. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I kind of want to tell you the story of of, um, of an, you know I'm told on Dr. Youth narratives, but it, it's very it's interwoven with uh, with my own experience becoming a researcher and kind of learning what that is, um, and and learning my my own position. Um, and I, I'm actually thankful that um, that Gabby presented before me. She just gave me some clarity on things that I think about, um, things I think I think. So um, my research actually started a few years ago um, when the Fireball program was still a baby baby. Um, Chantiri probably remembers that. Um, I started off with this grand question because as most researchers uh, do, we start off trying to solve the world. Uh, one paper at a time, and so um, that was my approach. And um, I wanted to I wanted to know what um, what hip hop's relationship was to the formation of undocumented youth identity, how it influences it, and um, if basically there was anybody else out there that felt like me, that felt um, hip hop allows you uh, to understand your own experience, your own. <laughs> so um, well, so then there's the answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's how you do research. Um, <laughs> All right, so that was that was where it started. Um, I was able to go to um, I was able to go to New York City uh, based on this internship um, through my minor, and I also had um, additional funds, and so I thought it would be amazing to be in New York City to ask questions and learn uh, learn from from one of the one of the origins of hip hop. Um, but interestingly enough, when I was over there, I found myself um, in these spaces that were putting me in an awkward situation. Um, I've always been very open about my identity, about my status being undocumented. Um, I kind of make fun about it sometimes and laugh a little too much. Uh, <laughs> um, but 
it, it put me in an awkward position because people would look at me, the people I tried to talk to would look at me like, um, you know, what do you mean you're undocumented and you're asking me questions about being undocumented? Um, and it was awkward and often it was, it was troubling to me to be doing a project on undocumentedness when I myself was undocumented. Um, it was troubling because I didn't want to make the assumptions that I had all the answers to all the questions, but at the same time it put me in a really distinct liminal space. Um, I think he left, but um, Professor Keith Feldman, uh, I took his class a year after that, and um, I started reading in depth a little bit more of um, the old school brother, uh, W.B. Du Bois, um, and his ideas of, of double consciousness really struck a chord with me. Um, I understood it as uh, something that still happens today in the modern world. It's not something that, uh, that was unique. It, w it was actually very unique to the African American experience, but it's also very applicable to, uh, to becoming um, a privileged, undocumented person. Um, it was interesting to, to, to find myself asking questions in a setting that's very much like the place where I live back home. Um, I was kind of an outsider and an insider in a really far away place. So it really, it really transformed my ideas of being a researcher in my own position. Um, and I came to ask questions about uh, what are the narratives of undocumented youth and more, more so than, than just the narratives, what are um, the experiences of this double consciousness? Um, and so that's how my, uh, my project moved forward. Um, so now I can start. <laughs> uh, so I, um, I developed- it was, very, it was a very reflexive account of your academic formation and your tension with becoming academic researchers. So especially with Alejandro, you talk a lot about liminality. Um, so I wanted to highlight a liminal space you inhabited between ethnic studies and anthropology, and you know I always ask you about that. So now, as you're getting ready to graduate, do you think you see some productive space where the two disciplines can interact, or should we throw anthropology in the fire pit where it belongs? <laughs> um, is there any anthropology? <laughs> um, no, I think I've, it's, it's interesting. I, I'm almost thankful that I stayed an extra year to finish out my anthropology uh, major because I was, I was going to drop it based on everything I had learned in ethnic studies. Um, <laughs> dang, I just said it like that. <laughs> A lot of the things I've read led me to believe that I should do that. Um, but actually, now that I've, I've, I've learned, um, I've been in anthropology just in it by itself. Um, I've learned a lot about Mexican anthropology and I've learned a lot about um, medical anthropology and I'm really fascinated by the field because I think ethnic studies, um, I don't want to say it's limited but everything is, is, is like the launching point to a lot of ethnic studies is identity and we don't move past identity and, and we'll take class after class on identity and so I think it's, it's great because that's part of our struggle half the time, you know, is locating exactly who we are in, in all these liminal spaces. But I think that um, advancing, you know, the, the study of identity through, through sciences or through, or through medicine or like through the work of Susan and, and doing such um, parents did, um, you see that more in anthropology. You see people of color that are studying, um, you know, in, in medical anthropology, you see people that are studying death, that are studying uh, shooting wounds and, you know, bodies. And so you see more specific things that are happening in our communities that in ethnic studies I just don't feel I ever got to. But that's not to discredit ethnic studies in any way. I think ethnic studies is very much trying to ground, you know, our very existence in this place. Like, you know what I mean? So, um, but I, I definitely, I'll say this. I'm, I'm glad I stayed the next few years to finish anthropology. And there's, I don't hate it. Um, and I'm sure you know this. Like, there's, there's, it's a push and pull. It's a tug of war sometimes. Um, but you know, every time you pull, it feels real good. So, um, that's what I try to do. And you know, I. As a scholar, I think I'm, I'm glad that I can borrow from two fields. I'm glad that I can learn from, from different things that contrast each other. Sometimes there's a balance, sometimes there isn't. And then sometimes, yeah, there's, there's, there's a beef, but um, you know, the more the merrier, I guess. More things to learn from. I had a question for Gabby. I don't know when you were working with that community of 67 sueños. Uh, sometimes I know like when you hear like, obviously like uh, this, uh, the, the dreamers to deserve, you know, to get citizenship, like that kind of gives you the other idea that there's some people who don't deserve it. I don't know if you, if, if you encounter like with that community, like I don't know if it was anger or like, oh yeah, we're happy about the dreamers, but we need to be considered into this too, or or just, I don't know, like it's kind of negative attitude. 
something like that. I don't know if you experienced that when you were working on that, on, on your research. Um, there's actually the um, Dream Act movement has some, um, it has shifted to a more inclusive movement. Then. Um, like before, I feel like um, the campaigns were mostly based on blaming the parents. I came here through no fault of my own. And now it's like my parents, you know, they're, they were the original dreamers. Like they came here and like they sacrificed their lives to like come here um, and, and work on um, really low wage jobs, you know, and like um, I think it has, the, the discourse definitely has shifted over time. But I don't think it has changed when it comes to legislators and mainstream media. Yeah, actually, I just want to thank all, all three of you. Um, great presentations. I really like that you're, you're confused and you're pushing the issues because I think you're, what you're challenging is the theoretical frameworks in all these disciplines about what does it mean to do research now and what does it mean to be a scholar. And what does it mean to actually be doing those two simultaneously in your community as an activist? So I think it's a completely shift of paradigms in any discipline. And questioning that, I think it's just amazing that you're all, aside from your own positionalities that you're in, that you're actually able to articulate that. So I just wanted to really just stress that, whoa, this is cutting edge work material. <laughs> that you were all amazing, and at least for myself, it has been an honor and a privilege not just to know you, but to learn from you, and to really um, hear the perspectives that you bring to all of these very fields that you're working in, and I think um, it's been an incredible experience for all of us, and we're thrilled to see kind of where this goes and where you guys end up. Um, and so, but thanks again to the board and to Elizabeth for making this program possible. And, and to all of our partners across campus, you know, Lupe, um, Fabricio who's on here, Juan Esteban, all, all the folks who, who've, been, who've been working with you guys, and I think you're an example of, of just how amazing our students are and, and, and the kinds of how we're gonna, you guys are going to push the envelope forward in the future. And I wanted to let everybody else know that we have dinner with actual plates <laughs> in the parlor, <laughs> which again would not be possible without, without um, equity and inclusion, and, and we hope that you guys will stay to continue these conversations, to talk to these amazing scholars, to eat lots of good food, it's pupusas, uh, uh, and to, to join us in really celebrating, this is really uh, the culmination of a, of a long time that these folks have been working on these projects, as you can tell, and we hope that you will help us celebrate them and, and their futures and all the great work that they've done with us. Thank you.